Good morning. It's hard to believe it's been uh, since March. We've been wearing these masks. You're wearing them everywhere you go. You're listening because you're compromised with your health. Don't want to wear a mask, whatever that might be. COVID is with us. And how much longer, we don't know, do we? But um, in the meantime, we're meeting. In the meantime, we're giving the word of God. In the meantime, God is good to us. Uh, he's protecting us. He's watching over us. COVID hasn't come into the church. It's come into our families that come to church, but God has protected our church and protected those who have got it, and we're thankful for that. We continue to pray for each other, pray for you, and just ask for wisdom and grace, uh, opportunities uh, to make a difference for the Lord, and just to be a light in an upside-down world. And so we're glad to have you with us today. We're in the book of Revelation. We're looking at Jesus Christ and God's plan for humanity to the very end and then into eternity. And so as John writes the book of Revelation, as it unfolds, he gives us basically a purpose statement. He gives us three ways in which Revelation is broken down. The first is in chapter 1. John writes about the things that he has seen. Well, what has he seen? He sees Jesus Christ. He is glorified. He is in heaven. He is ascended. Uh, and he is, he is uh, we're going to see he's worthy to unfold and to, and to bring into completion and fulfillment all the things that are going to unfold here. Jesus is transformed. He sees him in his majesty. In chapter 2, we see Jesus Christ doing what he's doing today. Uh, he's ministering to his church. He's ministering to the seven churches here, seven historical churches. And he's ministering to the church yet today, the churches that, that are following him today, preaching the word of God. We are in the church age, and until the rapture comes, chapters 2, chapter 3, this is where we're at in the book of Revelation. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is the focal point. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What have we found out so far? What have we seen about Jesus Christ? Well, he has shown us that he loves us. He loves you this morning. He holds us in his hand. He dwells among us, his church. We see him among the candlesticks. That's what the church is. We're to be a light for Christ. But he's there right in our midst. He's watching over us, protecting us, guiding us, sovereignly in charge of all things. And he loves us. He communicates to us his deep love. We see that Jesus Christ is our victory. You know, every day we're called to follow Jesus Christ in obedience, uh, to be overcomers. And we look at Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate overcomer. He was eternal, and yet he stepped out of eternity in this, in this sense, into history, into time and place, and he lived among man, and he overcame sin and death. He chose to do that because he loved us so much. We see that Jesus Christ is our accountability to the church at Pergamum. Uh, he, is, he is the truth. He is the standard for truth. He is, he is that double-edged sword. Um, he is, the Word of God is the truth for our life. It is the standard of truth for living for engaging life, for making decisions, for setting goals. It is truth for life, for showing us what our destiny is and our need for faith in Jesus Christ. He is just and he is right. He is just right. Um, and so he, he is all discerning. He is all authoritative. He brings, he brings that with him as he looks into our lives, into our hearts, and justly he does the right thing every time in our lives and in his church. And he has all authority over our life. He owns us. He bought us with his blood. We see this here in, in the book of Revelation, just these qualities of Jesus Christ, these divine qualities. John also reminds us that God calls us to rekindle our love, to love him in a fresh way every day, uh, to love him wholly, to put him first in our life. Ephesus reminds us of that. He calls us to be faithful. Uh, he calls us not to be afraid. We don't have to fear. With COVID, we don't have to be afraid. You know, if if... If we get COVID, we're still in God's hands. His timetable, His sovereignty in our life hasn't changed. We can't go through life being afraid. We can't be afraid of COVID. We have to make good choices. We have to be wise. We have to take precautions. We have to do all of those things just like we're expected to do. But we can't live in fear. We're to be faithful to Him, be faithful every day. This is what we are reminded of as we've looked at these early churches. Smyrna shows us this. We're called not to tolerate compromise in our life in our walk with the Lord. And we're called to keep growing uh, and to deal with sin uh, in our life and in our midst because we love people, we care for them. 
These are the these are the principles. These are the glimpses of Jesus Christ that we have seen already here in the book of Revelation. We come to chapter three today, or in verses one through six, and what we see here is that Jesus is call. He calls us to life. He calls us to be alive. Uh, he shows us that's his passion for our life, and he shows us that enablement. And so let's look at that. What Jesus does with these seven churches is he addresses a specific need in his church. He speaks to the church, to his church, the needs of that church. As he's speaking to uh, to Sardis here specifically today, he's also speaking to us, his church. The message is, is intended for this historical church, but not just for them. It's intended for all the churches of that time, even the churches that Paul ministered to, and it's intended for the church age, for every church our church today is intended for us and so that specific church that he writes to here is sardis here in chapter two chapter three verses one through six sardis uh this church is is north of ephesus you've taken this loop around this road in asia minor in turkey it's known for for harvesting dyeing uh and then producing wool uh it is it, this is this is uh one of the one of the great things that sardis is known for this is going to come up as a significant piece as we look at this passage. Um, it was thought to be impregnable. It couldn't be conquered. It couldn't be overwhelmed. It was surrounded on three sides. It was originally built on a mountaintop. It was, it was surrounded on three sides by sheer cliff walls and uh, thought to be protected in such a way that it couldn't be overrun. But twice it happened. Twice it fell because a lack of watchfulness on on those who were watching over the city. They were careless. That's going to be important in this text as well. It was once very wealthy, uh, had a glorious past. Now it's living on their past. This church is living on its past. The city is living on its past. It's looking back to what was. It's slowly in decline. It's not what it used to be. And there's a temple there, just like there is an Ephesus for the, for specifically for the uh, god Artemis, the God of fertility, the God over life and death here, as it were. And this is going to be also significant. It's, it's interesting how as John writes and as the Lord leads him, the qualities of Christ and the history of the city often blend together in the message that Jesus Christ is communicating. What he does with each church is he makes an assessment. What he does with our lives, he's always looking into our lives. And uh, he says this, he says, I know you. We look at verse, at verse 1, I know, I know your works. He says that to every church, I know your works. He is omniscient. He knows the life of this church, the body of works that define them. He knows our life. And because, because of that, he calls us to a, to, a, to a path in which we would honor him. So he's going to assess Sardis and our life as well. So what does he, what does he see? What's useful for us as we look at it and, and can glean and draw into our own lives? Well, he says here of Sardis, he says... Um, he says in verse 1, I know your works, and you have a reputation of being alive. The first thing that he addresses, the first thing that he sees there in verse 1, is they have a reputation. They have a reputation of being alive, of, of having a, vit a vitality, a spiritual vitality in their church. Um, the, the, the Greek here is, I know your reputation, I know your name. Your name, I know that name signifies everything about you, who you are. And, uh, and so it signifies this reputation is what we would call it. He says, I know, I know the reputation you have around. People come into your church, they, they think of Sardis, and they think of this church that's alive and vital and, and has so many wonderful things going for it. Um, you know, it's interesting that when Jesus came, we see in Philippians that the first thing he did is he made himself of no reputation. He who is the God of all glory, uh, of all splendor, of all majesty, he set all that aside. He came, he came as, a, as a babe and an infant. Uh, to a poor family and he set aside that that reputation he wasn't born into a, a wealthy family uh, he was he just simply came as a servant he set aside all the things that normally define us and he served us he says i know your reputation one of the challenges that we all face in our own life is just this thing of reputation how people perceive us what they see on the outside about our life we we can we strive to control so carefully what people see in our life on the outside but Jesus says I know I know who you are I know what's really true in your life and that's what he addresses here he says also in verse 1 he says you have a reputation for life but you are dead he sees us on the inside 
but you are dead. These are his words into the life of this church. As he looks, he looks at the church, he sees, he knows the community, the people, the, the past has defined them. Those who maybe aren't familiar with them anymore, they still have this image of Sardis. Uh, those that, that come into the church, they have this, they have this view that there's, it's a happening church in many ways. There's things happening there, and there's life there. But God looks underneath all those things, and he says this, but you are dead. What a, so, what a sobering point of view that Jesus brings. What a sobering truth that Jesus places upon this church. He says, and here's the reason, he says, your work is incomplete. Your work is incomplete. At the end of verse 2, I have found your works, I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. What they started, they haven't finished. People are impressed, but God isn't. Um, there, is, there is activity in their church, but there's not power. Uh, there's not the Spirit of God at work. Uh, there is ministry taking place, but lives aren't being changed. There is a casualness about ministry taking place. There is a, maybe a maybe a, a social element about being ch about church. There's a there's a gathering that always takes place, but there's not a community of Christ. There's not disciples being made. There's not people being transformed in their life. There's not the work of discipleship taking place. And so, what they started doing well when they first were saved, they're not doing those things anymore. They're not giving care and attention to their spiritual walk. And so Jesus says, your work, although it was good when it started, is incomplete now. It's come to a halt. It's come to a screeching halt. And so he says, you've got a reputation. But that's the problem. We hang on to our reputations. In our life, we hang on to our rep reputations. We work so hard at cultivating this, this exterior, when inside is what really needs the work. And God sees the inside. He sees your heart. He sees mine. He sees the life of this church. He knows so he's calling us to look inward. He's calling us to be, to be honest about who we are, not just to work on the outer shell of our life, not to be white on the outside but dirty on the inside. He says, here's the problem, 2 Timothy 3, 5, you have the appearance of godliness, but you don't have power. You don't have power. It's, you, it, the, the gospel isn't changing you. It hasn't changed you. You're not at this place before me in your relationship. You're not saying to me, God, change me. God, change who I really am. God, continue to conform me to you. God, I want to change. I want to be like you. He said, that's not what's happening in the life of the church. And so there's the problem. He does mention a positive here. In verse 4, as he's talking, he says this, um, But you have a few. Yet you have a few, you have still a few names in Sardis. He says, he's going to show a contrast here. He's going to show a contrast in verse 4, people who have not soiled their garments. So here's the contrast. There are a few in the church who aren't dirty. There are a few in the church who haven't soiled their garments. There are temples all throughout Sardis and all throughout Asia Minor. You were expected when you went to that temple to, to wear the garments that were appropriate to worship in that temple. You don't have to come in dirty and filthy and with your work clothes and just come in just as you were. You were expected to, to dress and to be differently. Jesus says before him, the way we live for Christ, we're to come before him in his presence. We're to come before him in holiness. We're to come before him with a, a passion to honor him in our life. We're to come before the Lord with our wills yielded to him. We're to come before the Lord with a desire to live for him. He says there is a, there is a group in this church. That's their passion. That's their life. They're not, they're not compromised in their walk with the Lord. Their life is not stained by choices that have that have marred the name of Christ. They're not stained by compromises that have, that have watered down and rendered their testimony ineffective. Uh, there is a group here who is faithful to me. So there is a positive element that he mentions here, but the church at large, he says, you're dead. You're living on your reputation. You're living on what once was. You're living on your parents, your grandparents, on what people still think of you, but, but you've lost. You've lost the urgency of your personal walk with the Lord. But what a, what a challenge it is for all of us to just take these words to heart and say, Lord, I want my life to be not out there where, the, where life is just living on the surface. God, I want, I want a depth in my walk with you. I want you to come out of my life. That's what's being pursued here. 
And so he puts, he puts this church on a path. Puts them on a path. He, and he says in verse 2, he says, wake up. He says, wake up. That's what he says. You need, to be, you need to be intentionally watchful. You need to make intentional decisions in your life. Sardis, you need to make some choices in your life. You need to re-energize your faith. You need to re-energize your obedience and your, and your, and your pra the practice of pursuing Christ. You need to wake up. You need to see life from, from an eternal perspective. You need to see life from a relationship with Christ. You need to wake up. You are asleep. you got to wake up spiritually. He calls us to that, to step out of apathy, to step out of a, a, a callousness, to step out of a, a lethargic way of viewing life around us. Is you need to see the world for what it is. It's dangerous. There is sin out there. There's a world that needs Christ and needs the gospel. You need to be a difference maker for Christ. And he says to Sardis, you haven't done that. You're not doing that. There's only a few in your church that are doing that. He says, wake up. He says also in verse 2, he says, and strengthen what remains. Strengthen what remains. What is, he says, uh, strengthen it. What remains and is about to die. He says, the church is on the verge of truly dying. He says, you're dead. Well, it's a, it's a word picture here. They're not totally dead. He says, they're about to die. He's going to give them hope here. He shows them hope. That's going to be really important here. He says, you need to strengthen what remains. Not only this small group in Sardis, but as a church, you need to strengthen what's left of this church and revitalize what's happening in this church. You need to bring life back into this church. He's saying the church doesn't have to die. He says to you and me in our, in our walk with the Lord, you don't have to live in this desert, separated and apart from God. You don't have to live in ap apathy and compromise Come back to the Lord. Let Him do a work of renewal in your life and in your heart. There is a deadness in your life. There's a deadness in the church, but that can change. That's what He's calling the church to here. He says you need to remember God's Word, verse, verse 3. And He says, um, Keep it. Remember those words you received? That's the Word of God. Keep it. Keep the Word of God. Obey it. Follow through on it. Be, be doers of the Word. That's what he says. Remember God's word. We need to pour it into our life. We need to pour God's word into our life. We need to feed on God's word. That's what he's saying here. That's important. He says here in Matthew 6, we're to watch and pray. That's to be watchful. We're to be watchful. Why? Because what's the motivation here? Because our flesh is weak. We're to watch and pray. We're to watch for God's work. We're to watch for his grace. We're to watch constantly be aware and on guard because, because the spiritual warfare, the spiritual temptation to be drawn from a faithful walk in Christ is always there. We're to be alert and on guard. We do that by praying. And as we pray, then God brings strength into our life. That's what we see here in 1 Corinthians 16. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. There's, there's a context here. And be strong. Because as we are on guard and we are watching for the things of the Lord, it brings the strength of God into our life. As we're watchful with the Word of God as our grid, as we're watchful to put the Word of God and its principles into our life, there is, this, there is the strength of the Lord that comes into our life. Motivation? Because we have an adversary that's, that's prowling, that's, that's destructive, that wants to destroy your life. Sardis is being chewed up. Sardis is being compromised because they are not making choices to follow after Christ anymore. They've compromised. There's a whole city here that needs the light of the gospel. Remember, Jesus is standing in the midst of the candlesticks. A candlestick has a candle. It is a light. That city, this church, Sardis, is to be a light for Jesus Christ. They are no longer a light for Christ. What's not in this text, there's no, surf, there's no suffering there's no persecution that's mentioned in this text because they're not living for Christ clearly. There's no distinction between their life and the life of the city around them. There's no, there's no revealing of truth of the Word of God of Christ through their life. And so there's no persecution. Motivation, because there's a day of accountability coming. To be watchful, to be alert, to be on guard because the Lord's coming again. So we're to encourage one another to walk in the Lord, to be faithful. 
so important here in this context because people need the Lord. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Sardis, there are people who need the Lord. In Columbus today, there are people who need the Lord. They depend upon Christians walking faithfully with Christ so that we can share the good news of the gospel. They need the gospel. The gospel has power and it has sway when our lives are in harmony with the message that we convey. The gospel has power when the Spirit of God can work through our life and touch the life of another. God uses us. He chooses to use us. What a blessing. He says we're to keep the Word of God in verse 3. What are we to do? We're to keep the Word. We're to pour it into our life. We're to keep it. We're to be doers of the Word. We're to repent. He calls them to repentance here in verse 3. That's what He calls them to. He says repent. We're to turn from our sin. We're to turn from the compromise. We're to turn from things that have... We've, we, our desire to make life easy to get as much out of life as we can get, to go for the gusto, to enjoy life as much as we can, to, to not ruffle feathers, uh, to not get people mad at us. That's what's happening here. And when we do that, we dilute the truth. We dilute our, our impact as disciples of Christ. We dilute our ability to reach a world who needs the truth, who needs the gospel. We impact that. We need to repent and turn, turn from things that have pulled us away from that kind of compromise and, and confess it and give it to the Lord and turn back towards walking with the Lord. In fact, in verse 4, he talks about the remnant, the group, and he says, and he, he gives them a promise here, but let's make a phrase here in verse 4, and they will walk with me. That's what we need to do. That's what he's calling the church here to do. He says, look at this remnant. This is my promise to them, but they are walking with me. They will walk with me. We need to walk with the Lord. That's what we must do. That's important. We're to live for Jesus Christ. He calls them to that. And in every every church, every uh, all seven of them, he says we're to be an overcomer. So he lays this path before the believers in Sardis, before you and I, and then he shows us his enablement in our life. That's what he does. He reminds us that the Holy Spirit is critical and key. We see here in 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 every church, this phrase is given that we're to we're to listen to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as He speaks into our life. He uses the Word of God. If you want to, if you want the Spirit of God to touch your heart, then open the Word. If you want the Spirit of God to make a difference in your life and to lead you and to guide you, open His Word. Listen to His Word. Love His Word. By doing that, love Him. It is individual, let him, that's singular, and let the churches, that's plural. He's speaking into the life of this church, Emmanuel. He's speaking into your life as you listen. The Spirit of God is key to transformation taking place. And then Jesus himself, as he calls the church to these steps, he reminds them, and I am your enablement. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We see here in verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God. We've already seen this. We've seen this in chapter 1, verse 4. This, this is the Spirit of God. This is a, The seven is the description of the complete work of the Spirit of God. What Jesus is showing Sardis and us is that everything that he ever does is in harmony and under the power and in the will of the Spirit of God as they accomplish the will of, this, of their Father, of his Father. The seven spirits of God. And he enables, he gives the Spirit of God to all of us. Scripture makes that very clear. And he holds us in his hand. We see that in verse 1. And he also has the seven stars. In chapter 1, verse 16, we see those seven stars. We believe they're not angels. Every time the word angel is used in, Evol in Revolution, it is angel, except here. Context does not allow for that. Just to remind you, because angels are never given leadership in the church. These are leaders. These, I believe, are pastors. The context supports that. And so he's... He's reminding them, I have, I have the ministry of your pastor in my hand. I'm calling him to a task. I'm also with him, working with him, challenging him, walking with him. So he, he gives to every church promises. That's really encouraging. Whatever he calls us to, he shows us the motivation for that. He shows us the result of that. He shows us his enablement in that. First thing that we see there is this. His promise is, well, consequence. In verse 3, he says, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. That's, that's what he says. He says, if, he says if, if you don't wake up, I will come against you like a thief. If, if you do not wake up, I will come as a thief. And you will not know 
You will not know the hour I will come against you or on you or upon you. If you don't wake up, I'm going to come upon you. You know, we many uh, this word, this concept, this word is often used parousia when it speaks of the of the coming of the Lord, the the rapture, the return of the Lord. This is not this is not that picture. He is coming again. It fits that, but this is more of a coming against or upon this church because he says here very care, very clearly in verse three, if you don't wake up, I'm coming. And so there's a condition here. His coming is is to deal with the church because they will not confess, they will not repent, they will not return to him. And so the coming is, is, is Jesus coming against the church, him removing favor, him removing blessing, him bringing uh, consequence against the church. But he says, if you repent, this coming is not necessary. As you repent, then I will come to you in grace, and I will come to you in renewal, and I will come to you in favor. But if you don't repent, I will come against you with consequence, consequence with judging. Paul reminds us that uh, judgment and his affirmation or accommodation are both a part of an ultimate picture. And so we need to remember that he's going to come one day. He's going to bring his discerning eye into our life. We're going to answer for that. He will also reward us for that as well. In fact, that leads us here in verse 4 and 5. He says, those who have not soiled their garments, they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The ones who have not soiled their garments, okay, they will walk with me in white because they are right with me. Their life shows they're walking in harmony with me. He says, I will clothe them in, in, in white. They will be clothed in white. That's what he says here. Okay? And so that is a reward that's coming. That, that is ultimate fulfillment of all of God's promises. We will be transformed. We will be made new. Our garments will be, we will be white as snow. Our sins will be ultimately be completely washed away as we stand in the presence of the Lord. We will be clothed in His righteousness. And in, it says, and in... Um, the white that he gives us. It is, it is the clothing that represents our walk with the Lord, represents our position that we have in Jesus Christ. We see a glimpse of that here in Revelation. We see martyrs coming out of the tribulation. As they stand before the Lord from every multitude, from every nation, from every people. They will be clothed in white before the Lord. That is important. But we see these are martyrs are coming out of the tribulation. Sardis, the church, is not going to go through the tribulation. We believe. We believe that we as a church today will not go through the tribulation. But we also have this glimpse in Revelation chapter 19. We have the church here, the whole church. Jesus Christ is coming back. The church is with him. And they are clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. And that linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It's, it's, it's my walk with the Lord. I'm clothed with the way I have honored Jesus Christ in my life. He calls the church to walk in righteousness. That's what he calls them to. He promises us eternal security. And he says, he says here, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. That is important. That is significant. Cities at this time had, had roll books, had log books, if your name was in there you were a citizen of the city it could be taken out if you were if you were guilty of an offense or, or for multiple reasons and you were no longer a citizen Jesus says here to you to the genuine child of God to you this morning a genuine child of God I will never blot your name out of the book of life Revelation shows us that in chapter 20 I saw the dead great and small stand before the throne the books were opened then another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. You have books against which we will be judged. Those are all the works that we have done in our life for believer and unbeliever. But then you have the book of life that's separate from these books. It is the book of life. The only ones whose names are in the book of life are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And their life will reveal that that profession of faith was genuine and real because of how they live their life. He's calling them to walk faithfully because they are children of God. 
If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is salvation or not salvation. If Jesus Christ is not my Savior, I have no relationship with him. It doesn't matter what works I've ever done in my life. My relationship is found only in Jesus Christ if I have trusted him as Savior. We see the very first use of this book of life in Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. This isn't just general sin. Here, it's, it's context. They had, it's a golden calf. They'd sinned and rebelled against God, and there were those who were still unrepentant. They would be blotted out. They were found not to be genuine followers of, of God, of Jesus Christ, ultimately here. They didn't lose their salvation. There's no losing of salvation in this text or in this passage. Those whose names are blotted out are those who are revealed to have not been genuine believers in the first place. They didn't walk with the Lord. They weren't faithful in their walk. They didn't reveal Jesus Christ as genuine in their life. Those who are genuine will never have their names blotted out. Yes, we sin. We confess that sin. We're sinners, but we are sinners whose sins have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. Our names will never be blotted out. Your name will never be blotted out. Eternal security. That's what he promises to us. I will never blot. In fact, he says here, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus Christ will will say our name before his Father, and we will be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand righteous before the Father because of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Now, he calls this church which is dead, he calls them to life. He says, you are about to die. He calls them to life. That's what he does. That's probably the message that comes out of this passage with the church. There's hope for us. Because the Lord, what he is asking, he enables. He renews and he revives us. That's what he does. He's calling the church to life. He's calling the church to to revival. He's calling the church to, to renewal. He says, you're dead, as it were, but you're not totally dead. Because you have the ability to respond. You have the ability to return to the life that you once had. There are those in that church, I'm sure, are unbelievers and never have walked with God. But he's calling to those to return to their faithful walk with God, to be a light, a candlestick for the Lord again. He renews and he revives. This is God's work. You know, for all of us, for unbelievers, it starts here. When we were dead, he made us alive by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Renewal starts here. I'm dead. Jesus brings life through faith. I'm dead. I cannot respond. I cannot love Jesus. I cannot believe. He gives me the faith to believe. He gives me life in Jesus Christ. He does the work. For the believer, just like the prodigal son, for my son was dead and is alive again. See, he was alive. He had relationship before he ran off and rebelled and he came back and was restored. It's a picture of of relationship with Christ um, and so and so it's a picture for us sometimes we can be caught out in the desert we can be we can we can lose our vitality in our in Christ he calls us back to renew us to bring that vitality back into our life so whether we need Jesus Christ as Savior for the very first time or we're a child of God who has wandered away Jesus calls us back renewal is the power of God it's his power just as Christ was raised from the dead we too might walk in newness of life. He is the power. He is our hope. He is the standard. It's truly a work of God. Just look at this in Psalm 51. Purge me. Wash me. Create in me. Renew. This is all the work of God. He does the work. And I will be clean. I will be whiter than snow. I will have a clean heart. I will have a right spirit within me. My will will be his. And so we come to him and we confess and say, God, I need you. I need you to do in my life what I can't do. Bring life back into my walk with the Lord. God, would you meet with me again and restore my life and my vitality to you? It is a work of God. He does that. We surrender. We yield. He does the work. It flows out of forgiveness. You were dead in your trespasses. God made us alive. Why? How? Because we were forgiven. When I'm dead or I'm wandering or I'm, I'm away from the Lord, when I come back, I, I run to him and I find this life and renewal. But I, but I find it because I've been honest about my relationship with him. There's confession that has take place. There's confession that needs to take place. 
And he forgives and he renews and he restores. That's what he does. What hope, what beauty. It's beautiful. It's transformative. We're to put off our old self. We're to be renewed. And we're to put on the new self. Those are choices that we make. It's, it's faith in the Lord, but it's faith in action. I'm making choices. Those choices draw me back into discipleship. And then the likeness of Christ, his righteousness, his holiness is poured into my life. Also, this benefit, it's the strength of grace. Prepare your minds, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of God that will be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I'm renewed, I'm renewed by the strength of God's grace. I yield to His grace, and I, am, and I, am, I go from uh, weak, discouraged, compromised, and I, and I move to a place of strength and passion and vitality in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, it's, it's motivated by the return of Jesus. He's coming back. That's motivation to walk with the Lord. Sardis is all about a church needing to, to rekindle their love for the Lord, um, to, to be revived in life before the Lord. For the unbelievers who are in this church, it's a call to grace. It's a call to salvation. To the believers who are in this church who have wandered away, it's a call to return to faithfulness to a strength of witness and discipleship that, that their life for Jesus Christ is clear. For this remnant that's walking faithfully is to remain strong. It's just, it's just pour strength into what remains so that it continues to the very end. It's a call into our life to do the same thing. God calls us to life so that we might have that, that thriving relationship with Jesus Christ and so that we might have that clear testimony into a dark world, to a lost world, that they might see Jesus Christ through our life. Trust that's your passion today. May God help you to return to that place. If there's an emptiness, a wandering in your heart, God would call you, remind you, that He's able to do that work of revitalization in your heart. That's what He does best. Lord, we pray that you would just draw this text into our heart. Bring us to that place of response to you that we would find new life in Christ. You have promised to give us life and to give it to us abundantly, not just for our pure enjoyment, but for our testimony, for our witness for Jesus Christ. We pray that we'd be faithful to that witness to the very end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us, and we will see you next week. On the 20th, we're going to have a special candlelight service at six o'clock in the evening. We invite you to come if you're able to. I'm going to do it COVID safe, but I just want to mention that to you as well. Thanks for coming today, and may God bless you this week.